it's an opportunity where you can actually practice your interview skills with real employers. So please have a check for that. Azola will be putting the link in the in the meeting chat for your convenience. We also have our regular career development webinar, so please check that out. You may actually find one or two that you may be interested in. And then we obviously offer our one to one consultation, so have a look out for that. And last but not least, we really have amazing, amazing resources on our website. So please check out the mini series Own Your CV as well as the um, Own Your Own Selection process. So I think let's start because we only really have an hour with each other and I know that it's going to be jam packed and really interesting. So um, I'm going to ask our panelists to unmute their mic. I'm going to ask Megan to answer the first question, followed by Raisa and then Mary Ann. So my first question to you is, can you please give us a brief account of your career journey? So maybe just briefly mention your, um, your educational background, that very first job that you've had and subsequent jobs. So over to you, Megan. Hi everyone, it's really nice to be here. Um, I studied a BA in English Language and Literature as well as um, Film Studies at UCT and an Honours in English. And then I, I did about a year and a half a gap year, uh, I think maybe, well my first job was actually in the UCT libraries as one of the, the librarians at Short Loans. Um, and then my gap year, I went back to my hometown East London and worked as a research institution at Fort Hare for a few months. And then I did a TEFL course overseas and taught English in Hong Kong, which sort of leads into how I informally got into education. And after that, I did a master's in London, in London studies, which is basically another name for a general interdisciplinary degree in urban studies. And then um, when I came back to South Africa, I did quite a lot of freelance um, work in urban research before I realized I needed to get a, a full-time job to pay my rent and I landed up at um, where actually I'm now, which is Get Smarter or To You. Thank you. That's really interesting um, for sharing that with us, Megan. So over to you. I think I said Raisa is next. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so I also studied a BA at ECT in Media and Writing and Business French. Um, and during that time, I got my first job, part-time job, while I was on exchange um, at UC Berkeley. Um, but then I went on to do my honors in media theory and practice, also at ECT. And during that time, I did an internship at uh, the company that I work at now, Hubble Studios. Um, and then the following year, I started working there full time. Um, so I was hired as an education writer. And then I became a content creator and then a junior learning designer. And I'm now a mid-level learning designer um, two years later. Um, yeah, so that's me. Thanks, Megan. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Mary Ann, over to you, please. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Megan. No, um, so I think my trajectory was probably slightly different. I started, um, I studied business science marketing also at UCT. Um, and then when I finished my degree, I was accepted into a graduate recruitment program. Um, I was there for about two years and decided that wasn't for me. So I also went to go and teach English in South Korea. Um, after which time I decided that I wanted to do something either in education or to do with sustainability and the environment, but that teaching wasn't for me. So I joined an organization called the Green Building Council of South Africa, um, which is an organization that promotes sustainable building practices. Um, and then my first role at the Green Building Council was in marketing. But while I was working at the Green Building Council, I started to, I came across the Masters in Educational Technology program at UCT. Um, and I sort of switched roles over to the education department. Um, before joining the organization that I work for now, SILT, the Center for Innovation in Learning and Teaching at UCT. Um, SILT was at the beginning of their, starting to embark on the massive open online courses project, the MOOCs project, and I came in as the first um, assistant learning designer on the MOOCs project. That was still while I was doing my master's. 
Then um, I got an opportunity to go and work at Get Smarter as a learning analytics manager, and I actually met Megan Tennant there. Um, and then after that, I did some freelance learning design work. So I worked for a number of a couple of organizations in the UK, um, as well as the Center for Innovation and Learning and Teaching. And then somehow I made my way back to UCT to SILT. And that's where my current role is. Um, I work as a as a senior project coordinator and learning designer. Fantastic. So I think um it's really amazing to hear that your career journeys have been similar and also different, but it kind of has have kind of brought you all to the same place, which is learning designing. So I find that really interesting. So thank you for that. Um, so I think my next question, I'll start with um, I'll start with Mary Ann and then followed by Megan and then lastly Raisa. So um, if you think about your core skills in your job at the moment, um, what what are those core skills and thinking specifically about the skills developed during your degree and also skills maybe in, in other contexts that you've developed as well. So Mary Ann, perhaps if you can go first. Thank you. Sure. So I think um, if you go for an interview in learning design, one of the core skills that yeah. is really core to the job is an understanding of um, pedagogy, learning theories and learning um, models. Um, and those things you do kind of get exposure to during your degree, or I did at least, but I think it's something that you kind of have to revisit when you are, when you're in, when you're sort of in the working world as well. Um, then another key skill I think is keeping up to date with um, educational technology. And those are things that you don't learning learning your degree. It's something that I think you have to keep abreast of. Um, so particularly understanding the structures of um, learning management systems and virtual learning environments um, and other learning technology tools as well. Um, I think in, in my current role, project management is also a core skill. Um, and it is something that I had exposure to during my first degree, my degree in marketing. Um, but it's not something that you that you a skill that you can learn without practicing it. So definitely the practice is a lot more valuable than than the theory, learning the, the theory of it. Um, and then I think two soft skills that I think are very, very important are listening or facilitation skills because a lot of the lecturers that come to us don't actually know what they want so we have to sort of facilitate that discussion with them and then when you're dealing with um i would say like uh, creatives briefing graphic designers and video producers communication um, is a really important skill as well being Thank able to communicate clearly Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, so, Raisa, do you would you like to add to um, what Mary Ann said? Or anything else um, with regards to skills specifically in your job? Uh, sure. Um, so, I thought about this a bit differently because I think I entered my current job as a fresh graduate. So, a lot of those core skills, like learning about VLEs and LMSs and pedagogy. I learned that on the job. Um, so although there are core skills, I think going into it, um, for me, it was really important to have a solid foundation of how to work in a team um, because pretty much every day, learning designers collaborate with various people um, in whatever team you're in. So that, that could involve graphic designers, project managers, um, videographers and, and so on. So having that um, understanding of what makes good collaboration and teamwork is, is really important. Um, in terms of what I got from my degree, I think having a solid foundation of you know good writing skills and research and editing um, was really solidified in both my degrees because I'm sure everyone can relate to like how every pretty much everything that you do and most of your time is spent writing, researching, and and so on. Um, yeah, and then adding to that, I in my honours year, I was online opinions editor for a newspaper. So I got a lot of 
experience um, writing, but also editing um, other people's work and articles. So knowing um, what is kind and clear feedback and how to give and receive feedback um, has been really valuable in my current role as well. Um, yeah, just being direct and um, helping each other out, like if you veer off topic, guiding people to the right place. Um, and then, yeah, just keeping uh, being kind, um, but also just making sure that um, you produce really good quality work. Um, yeah, those have been really key. And I got a lot of that from my time at UCT. Thank you, um, Raisa. Over to you, Megan. Sure, I think um, the first skill, I think which is what Marianne mentioned first was you know, thinking about how people learn. And I got that through teaching, teaching English, just it was almost like you, you learn so much at university and you're able to talk about things, but when you're actually trying to convey or, or teach things, it's, it's a different story. And I suppose that is a fundamental um, skill in the job is, is thinking about how a student is going to the content and how to create the content in a way that's logical and easy for them to grasp. Um, I think the, the second foundational skill and what attracted me to the learning design job at first was very much from my degree. So that's, um, as Raisa mentioned, that's, that's like the fundamental skills of writing, researching, um, having a logical argument, a compelling argument. And I think that's um, where a lot of the, the uh, learning designers come from. They come from quite a, a rigorous research and writing background. Um, now I'm also more in reviewing work and editing work. So it is also a lot about thinking about um, giving feedback on work. And then in terms of what I've learned in the job, it's very much uh, problem solving. Um, we work with quite a lot of difficult um, clients in terms of thinking about how we can um, visualize what they do in, in the lecture theater in, the, in an online environment and, and having a lot of relationship management conversations as, as well as people management. So learning to figure out what motivates your team and um, giving feedback accordingly. Thank you for that. I think um, just to comment on the fact that um, I mean, the, 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 the theme that kind of pulls through um, with what each of you have said is that um, there's a lot of learning that takes place on the job and that um, with the communication skills, um, the, the teamwork skills, um, you know, it all takes that practice to actually improve your skill set. Um, and I think that's what we try to encourage students to do is that not only do they learn those skills from the degree, their tertiary background, but it's to actually get involved in other activities for whatever, you know, whatever reason that is, and they would then develop those core skills whilst volunteering, whilst um, doing leadership um, roles, fulfilling leadership roles, that kind of thing. So it's really nice to hear that um, coming through with the conversation. Um, so thank you. Um, can you please tell us about your current organisation and exactly what your role entails? So I think maybe let's go back to Megan, start there, and then we'll um, go to Mary Ann and then Raisa. So over to you, Megan. Sure. So I work at, it's now called 2U. Um, it used to be called Get Smarter and was a, a startup founded by two brothers who also graduated from UCT um, maybe about yeah, 10 or so years ago. Um, and then a US company, 2U, acquired us a few years ago as well. Um, and basically, we offer online short courses with university partners. So one of our first partners was UCT as well, and we offer quite a few courses with them still today. Um, and it's thinking about looking at um, people who want to study part time in a very sort of short um, space. So it's usually about six to eight weeks, and it's usually people who are currently working and they want to explore something a little bit different or they want to upskill themselves so they're able to do it alongside their, their full-time job. Um, in terms of what I do day to day is, is basically going through the course design process first with faculty members. So we design um, the six to eight week course. We usually take about a month to design the whole syllabus with them and we workshop with them and brainstorm with them. It's usually me and another learning designer and then it takes about um, four to six months to then go through the whole development journey of module by module, writing the content, um, 
giving it to faculty for feedback, filming videos, creating graphics with our graphic design team, and then finally giving it to our learning technology team to upload onto the online campus. Wow, that sounds really interesting. Um, quite a long process, actually, when you, when you think about just a six to eight week course. So it's really interesting. Thank you for that. Um, I think I said, was it Raisa next? <laughs> I'm losing track of the order. <laughs> Mary Ann, you, you're welcome to go. OK, so um, I work at the Center for Innovation in Learning and Teaching at UCT. Um, basically, what we do is we support academics in um, managing teaching and learning challenges. Many of them have to do with or are focused on digitally enabled education, um, but but not all of them are. So it's not just with online. We we help in general with teaching and learning matters. Um, we have three sort of clusters in our department. The first is the learning technologies team, um, and, and that's the team that manage Fuller, which is, of course, our learning management system. Um, then we have the staff development team that focus on building skills and supporting teaching and learning, mostly um, like in, in a capacity development sort of um, space. And then we have the course and curriculum development team. Um, and this is the team that I belong to. And what we do is we help academics with designing their courses. Um, and we comprise of a learning design team as well as a digital media unit where the graphic designers and, and um, video producers sit. So I don't do that um, much detailed learning design any longer, but I oversee the course development projects um, and ensure that the quality standards are met. Um, I, I coordinate work with or and manage the workflow between the academic team, the learning design team and um, the graphic designers and video producers. And then I also am involved in like sort of what I would call maybe special projects. So um, we are busy working on a project to update the learning platform. I'm involved in that project as well as a new tools project um, where we are piloting a number of new educational technology tools um, and then I also like help internally with supporting management functions like the budgeting process and the rollout of um, project management software etc. Thank you, um, really nice to hear the, the kind of the workings of SILT um, at UCT, so thanks for sharing. Raisa, over to you. Cool, so yeah, I work at Hubble Studios. Um, we are an e-learning company based here in Cape Town. Um, and we are largely thought of as thought partners. Um, so we also provide short courses and any kind of digital learning courses or platforms to clients um, in the form of bespoke learning solutions. So um, clients come to us with a problem, um, or just something that they want to do, and then we create something custom. So our product is quite custom. Um, yeah, we largely do um, corporate projects, so that could include um, professional development, um, upskilling uh, courses, compliance training, things like that. Um, but we're also breaking into the academic and university space, so we're actually also working a bit with 2U. I met Megan Tennant also earlier this week. <laughs> um, yeah, so in terms of what I do, so as a learning designer, I form part of what we call the academic office at Hubble. Um, so I would on any given project, um, it's our job to kind of carry that golden thread um, from the beginning to end. So uh, that would entail forming a relationship with your client, uh, managing their expectations, and then also, um, similar to what Megan said, um, kind of workshopping content with them. That could also include reviewing content or writing it ourselves. Um, really depends what they actually want out of the product that we're delivering. Um, 
yeah, and then collaborating with other learning designers who are storyboarding or writing scripts for videos um, with our motion designers, graphic designers. It's a really um, creative and collaborative process from beginning to end. Um, and then we eventually will review any work from our team and uh, get feedback from our clients or any other stakeholders. And then eventually put the final product either on a VLE or send it through to our clients to do what they want with it, really. Um, yeah, so we're, we just see that everything is, all expectations are being met um, and that proper learning is achieved and yeah, we deliver the, pro the product to our client. So it's a really, the every day is a little bit different, um, but you get to work with really amazing people um, and learn a lot that you didn't think you would learn about, like uh, remittance companies <laughs> or um, anything like that. So it's really, really interesting. Sure, that, that is really, um, I loved hearing your stories and um, the common thread here seems to be Megan, <laughs> where she's interacted with, with both Mary Ann and Raisa. Um, so over to our next question. Um, yeah, if you kind of look back, um, what would what what do you wish you had known as a student? Um, so yeah, so this obviously only comes with hindsight. So um, maybe if we start with Mary Ann first, um, if you don't mind to unmute. Sure. Um, thanks, thanks, Megan. Um, I think I wish I had known that the job market is fast and there are very many different sectors and the different sectors offer different sort of challenges and different opportunities. Um, and I can only obviously speak for the sectors that I've worked in personally, um, but I think in a startup environment, the advantage is that there's lots of room for, I would say, rapid advancement. Um, but I think it's sort of like a high risk, high reward kind of an environment. In the corporate environment, there's lots of opportunity for development, um, but there's very defined roles. Um, and I think there's opportunity for advancement, but you need to sort of do your time. Um, and I think, yeah, one of the benefits of the corporate world is that salaries are also quite competitive. Um, or actually, I should say that it's good, <laughs> not competitive. Then in the non-profit environment, it's kind of like an anything goes type of environment. And I think it depends on the individual organization. I was quite fortunate um, in the organization that I was in, um, the Green Building Council. But I think it's kind of a lack of the draw kind of a um, situation. Um, and then in higher education, I would say, particularly in an organization like SILT, because remember I joined SILT sort of, I think it would have been like five years ago, and then I've made my way back here. And I think it matters where the department is in terms of their journey. Um, so at the beginning, when I started at SILT, um, the department was only sort of starting to focus on digitally enabled education. And at the time, if I'm very honest, I feel like there probably wasn't that much room for um, for growth, whereas now it's a very different place. So that that trajectory of where the organization is in their pathway is important. Sure, that um, your answer displays your vast kind of experience through the different sectors and organizations. Um, so really wise words coming from you, Mary Ann. Thank you for that. Um, perhaps, Megan, if you don't mind unmuting um, and sharing your pearls of wisdom with us. Sure. <clears throat> yeah, I was thinking about this question. Um, and maybe that just a career is, is is a long evolving one. And I think when I was a student, I had this thought that, um, you know, and I think it, it ties in with the message I saw in the chat from Gemma about what I initially planned. Coming from humanities, when I enrolled in humanities, like I'm going to be a film director, I'm going to be a writer. <laughs> and there's definitely, you know, there's, there's, there's scope to do that. Um, but I think it can, and I think for, for the first years of, 
of graduating from university as very disillusioned. I was like, what happened to <laughs> becoming a famous writer? Um, and so I think looking back, um, I think I've learned to to realize you can you can shape your own career and there's different moments for for different um, focuses. And so I'm very stimulated in learning design, but that doesn't mean that I that I have to necessarily give up my passion for writing on the side. Um, I'm actually doing a, a part-time master's in creative writing at UCT, but realizing that I don't necessarily need to invest my whole full-time job in something that I still love from university, but it's not necessarily going to earn me money. And being able to compartmentalize and also realizing that my career will evolve. So maybe in five to 10 years time, I might be able to, to make shifts for the things that um, are side interests. So being stimulated in, in my daytime job is also important, but also thinking about the things that I, I, I sort of studied as passion projects in university. I don't necessarily need to give those up just because they're not earning me a living. Fantastic. I, I loved what you said, and I think it, it demonstrates that um, careers are journeys. So you develop that career as you kind of meander through life. Um, and yeah, so there's, there's lots that I can share, but um, I think just for our students, it's that, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to know that you may have a certain idea, start off with that and how that could possibly change depending on the opportunities that presents itself and how ready you are to kind of engage with that. Um, and so, yeah, but I think we can, can go off on a side tangent discussing um, career journeys and paths, but we still have Raisa to share her insight um, with us. Raisa. Yeah, um, so I think I have a lot of the same um, thoughts as Megan regarding um, career journey, but of course I only did my honours in 2018, <laughs> so I'm quite a newbie in the, the industry and also just the working world, um, but that also means like student mindset is still very much fresh um, in my mind. So what I thought of first was um, remembering the value of speaking up for yourself um, in any situation, um, especially at work, you know, um, advocating for yourself to um, take on new responsibilities or maybe even negotiating a raise or promotion or something like that. Um, you know, knowing your worth and being able to speak it and vocalize it is, is really important. Um, and just really speak about what you believe in because um, you most likely work with really great people and find people that um, believe in similar things that you do. Um, yeah, so that was like a very general one. And then also um, professional etiquette. Um, no one really teaches you that um, when you're studying and it's actually such a key thing to everyday life when you're working. Um, so yeah, just like kind of knowing the ins and outs of how to send a good email or interact with your colleagues that are a lot more senior than you are. Um, it's not as scary as you would think. Um, so kind of like breaking that, not so much a stigma, but just um, having some kind of conversation around how to operate at work and be yourself, but also be professional. Um, yeah, and then also jumping off of what Megan said, um, when I started working, um, I, I didn't really know what learning design was, even when I did my internship the year before. Um, and I was kind of doing it because it was a cool opportunity. I wanted to try something different. I also thought I was going to be a writer with a magazine or something like that. Um, and then I went into the full, full time, so not really sure of if this was what I wanted to do, wasn't really sure where I was going. Um, but that's just, I think taking that step into the unknown is something that you do need to do to really see, come test the waters and try, trial and error is really important um, because you never know what could actually work. And now I love learning design and I want to study it further. So if I didn't take that step, I wouldn't have known that. Um, but also just, um, try not to put as much pressure on yourself to find um, that perfect job or that like dream career. Um, 
because just speaking personally, I don't necessarily want my career to be like a permanent sticker on my personality. Um, I just want to be a person who does this also. Um, so yeah, yeah, do the work and, and if you enjoy it, that's awesome. Um, but also try to find work that um, also allows you to live the lifestyle that you want and, and find a balance because you obviously need to earn money um, because of capitalism. But um, yeah, don't put too much pressure on yourself is what I would say. Um, and just try things out and do it for the experience. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Raisa. Um, also loved what you, you shared with our students. Um, I almost feel like I want to recruit you into advisory, actually, <laughs> um, because um, absolutely to, to kind of be open to those opportunities and to almost understand that you're kind of taking these stepping stones into a certain general direction. And I think, again, just to encourage students that if they have an idea of where they'd like to see themselves, um, you know, come and visit us, um, set up a consultation, talk to us, see how you can kind of um, be ready for those opportunities and where to even look for those opportunities. Um, so thank you so much to all three of you for sharing um, those wise um, pools of wisdom. And then um, this is our last question. Um, what would you advise students entering the learning design sector? today. So um, I don't know, maybe um, Megan, if you could go first. Thank you. Sure. I think it's it's a slightly um, difficult question because I only know from my experience that um, a to you get smarter, but um, yeah, maybe Raisa and Marianne might, might share the same things that I'm talking about. But I would just say in terms of um, as learning designers, it's, it's it's ultimately a, it's a generalist job. So you know you have you have specialties in in thinking about how people learn, but you'll be touching so much different content. And I think a core skill is being able to, and it comes with practice, but being able to hold the ambiguity of of not knowing a lot of what you're working with. So you'll be working with you know whether it's the blockchain or global health or some kind of law and acquisitions course. It seems quite overwhelming, but it's very much being able to use this core skills that you get from studying a degree, which is learning how to research and um, that really get to grips with, with a piece of content. So I'd say entering that space, just being, being willing to learn how to be versatile, um, being curious. And I think also thinking about um, how you can better understand the user or the student. So um, one of the things I've learned in, in my role is like the principles of design thinking or user experience design. And there's a lot of resources, um, you know, available MOOCs as well that, that could give the fundamentals of, of those kinds of skills. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Um, over to Raisa and then Mary Ann. Raisa. Struggle to find my unmute button. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, same with Megan, my experience is quite singular to the company that I work at and the only company that I've worked at. Um, but I'm cognizant of the audience and kind of trying to think of what I would want to know um, as a student, not really knowing what learning design is. Um, so I would just encourage reading as much as you can. Like there are so many online resources out there um, to give you snip, uh, snap, snapshots of um, what the e-learning industry is um, and ed tech in general. Um, so that's like a really nice starting point. But more generally, um, I would say just apply anywhere um, and everywhere. Try to get internships or just reach out to people um, on LinkedIn because LinkedIn is a really great place if you don't have an account yet, maybe sign up because people are very receptive and very approachable on LinkedIn. Just reach out and ask questions here and there. Um, look at people's profiles and see their history. Maybe you could get some inspiration there. Um, I know that's what I did when I, um, I think, was in honors because I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. Um, yeah, so just don't be afraid to reach out and ask for advice and ask for help. Um, when you need it and even if you don't because having people 
people's thoughts um, can be really valuable when you're not really sure where to go yet, um, and even if you do. Um, yeah, and just, I think as learning designers, we, we wear a lot of hats. Um, I know at least at Hubble Studios, we, we do a lot of different things um, as one role. But what's key is just um, having that passion for learning. So don't um, lose your drive or love of learning and um, yeah, remain inquisitive and curious. So just read wherever you can and try new skills, upskill here and there, try coding, try graph design. You know, the more skills you have under the belt, um, the more you can actually give in whatever role you take on. Yeah. Thank you. Um, but you see, you're actually reminding me to tell our students we actually have a LinkedIn um, presentation um, by a UK LinkedIn um, um, presenter um, on the 25th of May. So please have a look out um, on our website closer to the time. It uh, will prove to be a really um, interesting conversation about LinkedIn, how to set up your profile, how to use LinkedIn um, effectively. Um, because we also, in our consultations, encourage students to even use it as a research tool, apart from the networking and looking for jobs. So please um, have a look out for that. Um, so thanks for reminding me, um, Raisa, to say that. And then Mary Ann, over to you, please. Sure. Um, so I think my point follows on from what Raisa was saying, um, the the developing your skill set thing. Um, I I sort of have in my time looked at a lot of different learning design um, like job specs and what I noticed is that different companies or different organizations put emphasis on different skills so whereas one company might put emphasis on um, writing skills other companies put emphasis on um, learning how to use a particular package like articulate storyline and some companies even require you to have graphic design skills they require um, it, learning design is a very generalist sort of field but they require you to have specialist skills from other fields um, and so my advice would be to think about where you want to be the type of organization you want to be and then then see like what sort of skills they require um, in, in terms of their learning, learning design roles and try to upskill yourself in that direction. Um, and also do lots of research, um, sort of put out alerts uh, to see when organizations you're interested in working at are, are recruiting. Um, and also just try to, as Raisa said, try to um, do an internship if you can, because a lot of organizations do require you to have work experience, which is, is tricky. So if you can find an internship position, go for it. Thank you. Thank you for that. So we've had some um, really interesting questions, um, which Azula has sent to me. Um, so we'll see, we have about 15 minutes left. Um, so just to, to any one of you, and you may just indicate by raising your hand, um, who would like to answer. So I'll read the first question. Um, what did you initially plan on doing as a career when you first started your studies? And I, I think I remember Megan saying, you know, you had this burning passion um, to be a writer. Um, so I don't know, maybe if we could hear from Mary Ann, um, you know, what your initial thoughts were when you started university. Um, sure. Sure. Want so, when I finished matric, I had absolutely no clue what I wanted to do. I think like students today are a lot more switched on. I had no clue. I mean, I and then I start when I started, I started off um, wanting to do law, did my first year, not first year of law, but my first year, of, my first law course in business science and thought this is not for me. I'm not interested. So I switched to marketing um, and then I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. I, I, I enjoyed marketing um, and I thought actually that I wanted to go into advertising. But then I, I, when I worked in my first job, we worked in the, I worked on the client side of advertising and decided 
that advertising is not a career I want to go into. So yeah, my my can my um, thoughts were all over the place. I must admit. Thank you, thank you for sharing that, and I'm sure that um, a lot of us students can relate to what you've actually just said. Does Megan or Issa, do you want to maybe add to what Mary Ann said, um, just with your own experience? Um, yeah, sure, I'll go. I think besides wanting to do something in the creative industry, there was always a pull towards academia. And um, I think I've come to peace with maybe not going the academia route. But if I think about a lot of my colleagues, a lot of them have, you know, sort of gone and put in the path in terms of um, doing PhDs and I think instructional design or learning design is a natural sort of sister sister job because you're still, um, particularly in my um, industry, working with universities and working with the the research and writing, but just in in a slightly more different like different sorry different practical way. Um, Issa, do you want to add, or could I go to the next question? Um, I guess I'll just say that I I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I was when I was in first year when I just started, um, and then when I was deciding what to do after um, my undergrad, I was testing all kinds of things. Like I did an internship at Fair Lady magazine, was totally disillusioned because it wasn't at all like Devil Wears Prada. Um, <laughs> I was thinking of applying to Silwood. Um, I applied to Red and Yellow. Um, so yeah, there were a lot of things flying around in my mind as well. Um, but yeah, again, it was about trial and error. So I really just tried something out and then I ended up liking it. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so Dreisa, I'm, I'm going to keep you in the hot seat if you don't mind. Um, you have two questions, um, so specifically for you. Um, what are your daily duties, roles, and responsibilities as a junior learning designer, as opposed to the mid-level that you, you um, described previously? Um, yeah, there is, I think the main distinction between the junior and mid-level was the amount of responsibility on projects. I think Raisa has frozen on us. So just give it a little moment and see if she comes back. And if not, I might jump to one of the others and to answer some of the other questions. OK, I think let's let's move on. Um, so we'll come back to Raisa when she's back with us. Um, so the next question is, is it possible to freelance as a learning experience designer? So maybe Megan or Mary Anne, any ideas about that, freelancing? Um, Megan, you can go first if you'd like, but I can also speak to this question. Um, so I think it's a little bit tricky because my freelance work came directly from sort of networks that I had when I was already working as a learning designer. So it is possible, but I think it's possible, it's more likely once you have a little bit of experience. There are also um, platforms that you can, that you can um, like put your portfolio on, your, your CV on. Um, the one that I used, I think was called Upwork. Um, and I did get a couple of jobs from Upwork. So um, it, it is possible, but probably I think more likely once you've had a little bit of experience. Um, Reisa will come back to you, um, but still on freelancing, um, how do you market yourself and where do you market yourself? Um, and how do you find clients? So if you do have a little bit of that experience, how would you go about um, kind of almost getting out there? So Mary Ann or Megan, um, any, any um, idea about marketing as a freelancer? Um, and way to actually get clients. I'll defer to Marianne if you do know, because yeah, I haven't actually had experience freelancing. Sure. Um, I so as I said, I I used a platform called Upwork. Um, it's a, it's a free it's a platform for freelancers yeah. of very like varied sort of in very varied disciplines. Um, yeah. 
but it was mainly through the networks that I had acquired over the years. And I think it's important to maintain your networks. So like, you know, whether you go for a job interview and don't get the job or whether you meet people in different organizations, it's important to keep, just to keep in contact with your, with your professional network. So definitely do that if you, um, even if you don't think that you're successful in the, in the initial, um, like in, for example, in an interview, it's in, like it's that person may keep you in mind if you, um, yeah, if you just stay in contact and and um, let them know that you're interested in in work. Yeah. Um, just the point on networking. Um, it is so essential to network. And if any of our students are interested, we do a webinar on specifically networking and LinkedIn. Um, because you find that a lot of professionals in posts today actually were kind of um, were, were told about the posts or made those opportunities available through their networks, exactly um, with what you said, Mary Ann. So thank you for that. Um, Marisa, you're back with us. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. We just saw you freeze on the screen. Um, so oh, no. so I'm, I, I, I think you were saying about your responsibilities definitely were far greater with the mid-level mid than junior. I'm not sure if you're wanting to add to that question, but you have one more. Um, okay. After that, I will try not to cut out. My my connection's a bit iffy, so I may turn my camera off. Um, but yeah, so in terms of the responsibilities, um, we have lead learning designers on projects, and then uh, several other learning designers on a project um, who would storyboard or implement on our um, authoring tool, things like that. The lead learning designer um, manages the client relationship with the project manager and then also um, reviews or edits any work from the other learning designers. So that's kind of the main distinction there. Um, and also owning a project from beginning to end. Um, yeah, that's pretty much um, the main distinction. Um, so the next question to you, is it possible to, to juggle a WFH contract position whilst completing a BA honours full time? So juggle a WFH, do you know what that is? Work from home. Oh, of course. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I should have known that. <laughs> um, so over to you, Raisa. Um, I think that I remember honors, um, my honors year, I did have a lot of time, um, but I filled that with a bunch of extracurriculars. So like I, I mentioned before, I was in Boston newspaper. Um, I was a media tutor for first year media studies. Um, I, I did a bunch of other things as well. So I filled that time, but um, I, I can't remember if you said it was a full time work from home position, but I think that part time work would be quite um, possible. Um, it would just take uh, time management um, because you're obviously going to have to juggle those two things, your assignments and also <clears throat> the position would most likely, if it's in learning design, um, most likely involve a lot of writing, editing of the same sort that you do in honors. So yeah, if you're comfortable with um, juggling those two things um, and it's a part-time job, I think it could work. Um, yeah, but just be conscious of um, the time management that it would take. Um, and it would take some, um, like any with anything, it would take some, what's the word? I can't think of the word, a very simple word. Um, <laughs> but yeah, just trying to manage those two things in your in your calendar. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so on to the next question, um, and this could be open to anyone. What do you appreciate about your working environment? Um, and do you feel anything can be improved upon? So anyone could answer this. Um, I guess I'll jump in. Um, so at Hubble Studios, we, when we were in office especially, um, we have a very 
Um, I've said collaborative too much, but it's a very collaborative environment. Um, and the people are genuinely really lovely. So um, there's a strong team culture. And um, when I started, I think, or when I did the internship um, in my honors year, the average age of employees in the company was 26. Um, so it was a very young company. We, we obviously have expanded a little bit um, now. So um, there's a lot of commonality in terms of kind of characteristics, um, personalities, and likes and dislikes. It's a kind of typical millennial space. Um, so we have like a pool, pool table and little poofs and ten, uh, table tennis, things like that. It's, it's very fun. Um, so that's something that I appreciated going into it straight like, as a fresh graduate, um, having that sense of um, casualness um, in, a, in a professional space. But at a deeper level, um, what's really been very clear since working from home for the last year or so um, is that kind of close-knit team structure, um, specifically for the, our team of learning designers. Um, I really appreciate the support that we give each, other, give each other because we love learning so much and we love helping each other learn. So not just... Um, our students that we make courses for, but each other. So anyone in our company. Um, so yeah, there's there's a, an active culture of learning and um, self improvement, uh, which is is really lovely. Thanks for that. So I'm I'm going to actually move on. There are too many questions, and we're not going to get to it. And we have four minutes left. So I'm hoping that um, Mary Ann, this question is specifically to you. Um, what knowledge can someone acquire from business science in marketing that can be applied to advertising specifically and creating videos for advertising such as explainer videos for various companies? Sure. I, um, I graduated from my marketing degree in 2006, so I think a lot may have changed since then. Um, when I was studying, there was a course called advertising in, um, I think it was in marketing two, which we did in third year, in third year. Yeah. Um, I hope that by now the curriculum has evolved, but I think those specific skills that you're talking about in terms of making videos, it's also a skill that I have had to learn and it's really a skill that I've taught myself. Um, and I think, so I, I, I sort of taught myself out of necessity how to edit videos very on a very basic level, I must say. It's like a really, really basic level that I, my editing skills sit. Um, so I wouldn't claim to have very strong for example, video editing skills, but I guess whatever skills, sort of like professional skills you want to learn, like video editing, those skills are easily learned from, um, you would definitely be able to find free online courses that can help you do that kind of a thing. I'm not sure what the, like the business science marketing curriculum provides that can give you those skills directly. I hope that helps. I know it's not a direct answer, but I hope that helps. Um, sure, thank you. Thank you, Mary Ann. Um, I see Tobile is asking, are we allowed to ask questions using the mic? Um, and we're running out of time. We have minute, one minute left. Um, and then I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of torn between the different questions. Last question that I'm squeezing in. Is there any particular book or course you could recommend for someone who wants to be an instruction designer? Um, don't wait there. Uh, um, so, Megan, I know that there are books. I don't, I don't, I, I can't say that I've read any of them, but I have heard of some of them. 
what I can do is to go have a look around because I like one of what two of my colleagues may have mentioned them and send them to you to pass that on. Um, but I can't think of the name right now. OK, thank you. I, th I think there are quite a few questions that have not been answered because we've actually run out of time. And I think maybe what I could do is pose it to you and then collate it and send it out to the attendees um, of today's session. So um, the last thing that I'd like to say is please for our students to fill out the feedback form. We really do value hate your, um, your, your feedback. And then to our panelists, um, thank you so very much. Um, for making your time available to spend with us. Um, we really do appreciate it. And I hope that our students feel inspired by having um, listened to your stories. Um, so thank you so much. And um, yeah, have a good day further and a great weekend. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you.